Well, actually, SeaCare um, is um, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education um, here at Stanford. It's part of the medical school, and it's um, under this umbrella of, you know, of, of Stanford Neuroscience Institute. And, um, you know, our mandate is really to um, uh, kind of promote study, scientific study of um, compassion, altruism, empathy, and many of these qualities that uh, define us as, uh, you know, kind of um, moral creatures, moral beings, and also uh, explore the possibility of developing programs that could be brought into um, many other constituencies like education and, um, you know, healthcare, where uh, people can be um, learned to, you know, deliberately and consciously develop compassions, uh, greater compassions for themselves and others. Um, so, um, so we, um, it's, it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary group of scientists uh, from neuroscience background, psychology uh, and clinical, as well as um, we have economists um, who, are, who do what is called neuroeconomy, which involves uh, using neuroscientific measures, uh, methods to study human behavior. And then, wow. and then e we have... Economics is the major reason for happiness. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. And, uh, and then we have uh, uh, Buddhist scholars like myself who help, um, you know, both at the level of concept definitions and so on, yeah. as well as also development of the, the actual curriculum and, and practices. Um, my other, um, so that's why I'm here at Stanford. And so how I, did this idea uh, come about? Well, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, in 2005, His Holiness was invited by Stanford for a symposium on uh, suffering and craving and depression. Mm -hmm. um, and he engaged in conversation with neuroscientists and clinical scientists and specialists. And uh, they, it was a very rich mm -hmm. conversation between the scientific perspective and the Buddhist perspectives on understanding of depression, suffering, and, and ways to deal with them. So uh, some of the people here felt that there was a genuine potential if this conversation could be followed up. And um, among them was uh, is, um, uh, you know, Jim Doty, Dr. James uh, Doty, who's a neurosurgeon, and now back here at Stanford on the faculty. He's a, a clinical professor, and he genuinely felt very, very moved. And uh, you know, uh, and he's a very compassionate person. And he felt that, you know, since there there is so much potential here by engaging the two, you know, ways of looking at uh, mental phenomena, you know, why don't we, you know, explore the possibility of having something here more permanent? Mm -hmm. So he initiated it, and he personally donated. Um, the seed money for that, mm -hmm. and then uh, was able to attract a number of um, scientists who are already based here, mm -hmm. and then brought me on board uh, to be part of this. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so that's why I've been coming here, f you know, fairly regularly, and I have a, a visiting scholar position at the mm -hmm. medical school, and uh, a, a, and have been on the executive committee of CCAM. Um, so how do you think this thing, uh, uh, how do you think in the future this thing expanding? I think, um, you know, one thing that it has already done is to really uh, draw uh, the scientific community's attention to the, uh, you know, doing research in this domain. Um, so we, we have already had several, um, you know, experiments that were done and now more and more people in different universities are doing research in the domain. Um, but um, in terms of the education side, I think, you know, we have now successfully developed an eight-week training program, which has been delivered many times, including on the Google campus um, to Google employees. Um, so the next phase would be, and we have been, take, you know, collecting data as well. Uh, and the next phase is to now and which is now which has now started to develop a, a teacher training program mm. for people who will be trained as instructors certified instructors for delivering this course mm. um, so that's our next phase so that we have a lot more instructors around the country and then uh, an, what we are exploring is also a possibility of adapting mm. 
this particular curriculum to different purposes like school and uh, professional kind of you know management and leadership they all um, need help. <laughs> yes yes and as well as uh, a specific yeah. program for um, you know healthcare professionals um, in you know because they have yeah. problem of compassion burnout yes. uh, they have problem of uh, you know job satisfaction yeah. uh, you know management of stress yeah. so we feel that um, the program that we have can actually um, help a lot of people in these various areas so i think that's going to be the next step so i want to change topic i yeah. want to talk about your other passion Oh, yeah, they're in Tibetan classics. Yeah, Tibetan classics. classics. Yeah. Well, that's my uh, other hat. And yeah. in fact, that's my bigger hat. My yeah. main work is really been dedicated um, to um, preservation and revitalization and also dissemination of classical Tibetan uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and, and texts. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is to set up a, a small organization called Institute of Tibetan Classics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I run it from my house. Mm -hmm. and. It's, it's an, a sort of an umbrella organization that coordinates the work of um, scholars all over the world. Um, we raise the funds mm. and then we assign uh, scholars with specific areas of expertise mm. to projects from this classic series. The idea is to produce um, a reference library of about 32 large volumes. Um, that would cover the whole field of traditional um, knowledge, including Tibetan medicine and uh, other topics as well. Um, so I oversee this pro project. I raise the funds, um, and um, I also uh, do some of the translation myself. But we are also producing um, first a complete set in Tibetan. And what we are doing is we are bringing now the modern kind of, you know, Western convention onto the classical text okay. by reformatting them okay. and inserting subheadings yeah. without touching the text themselves yeah. other than comparing the editions and annotating yeah. the differences, yeah. but to make the text much more manageable and readable mm. with a very comprehensive list of content. Mm. Uh, as well as a very long essay at the beginning that is written by me mm. so that the future generation teachers who will use these will have a much greater resource I have to draw from. mind training. Yes, yes, yes. I, <laughs> it's a big one. My friend had taken and you had signed my name on it. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> at that time I did not know that someday yes. I'll be <laughs> yes, meeting yes. you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, so what help uh, can the world provide? This is a noble, noble effort. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, at this point, the classic series is really not so much aimed at ordinary general reader, readership. Um, our aim is to really the library, um, to ensure that all of these texts are produced well and they're in the libraries. But our hope is down the line, we will produce more accessible paperback selections of the text for general distribution. So I think what the world can do is to, uh, you know, as much as possible, you know, try to engage with some of these texts so that you have a deeper appreciation of what the classical Tibetan and, and by extension the classical Indian heritage really represents for the world. I mean, you know, Tibetan, in, in fact, His Holiness doesn't like to call Tibetan Buddhism because he says, no, no, no. You know, he likes the word Indo-Tibetan tradition because he says that it's, it's, it's Indian. His Holiness is our number one uh, yes, ambassador. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, what we see in the classical uh, Tibetan tradition is essentially the heritage of Nalanda, um, where, you know, if you look at, you know, for example, the Abhidhamma texts, or whether it is the Vajrayana astronomy, um, or whether it is, um, kind of, you know, meditation practices that, you know, say primarily based on the Yogacara teachings, they have very profound insights. Yes. And these are products of individuals who dedicated their entire thought and life to discovering, you know, uh, insights into the human yes. condition. Yes. So I think, you know, my hope is if we create good translations 
of these texts with good introduction, then later on, you know, the contemporary scholars can engage with them and then may be able to do a second level of translation, which is to really make, you know, kind of take something out of the cultural context um, of a very specific time and put it in a in a way that ordinary person can relate to. And as you were saying about Heart Sutra, even though people don't understand it, yeah. there's a value in... Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So th these may be classics, yeah. but even common people, just by being exposed to it, sure. they will yeah. benefit exactly. from it. Exactly, I mean, for example, like the way in which Greek classics have shaped and informed and to this day, yes. you know, serve as a kind of a, a bedrock. Yeah of the liberal, uh, you know, philosophical heritage. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, yes. the Indian classics of the great masters, the Tibetan text, really represents the bedrock, yeah. you know, from which you can always continue to draw. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's like a, you know, a spring, yeah. you know, spring well. Yeah, it's a bedrock for consciousness. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, thanks a lot, and... Uh, uh... No, it's uh, wonderful. Okay, okay guys. guys. We, so yeah, before, before you go, you want to have a cup of coffee? Yeah, I can, can make some, some yeah. uh, because it's a bit yeah, of a drive. Right. Okay. Yeah, and then I, those who don't want coffee can have some. No, no I, I'll have coffee. So I'll, I'll make, make some, some coffee. coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, Everybody wants coffee. coffee. Yeah. yeah. So did you start? No. Not so long.